Thank you for coming and to the USF FARA Ninth Symposium here in Tampa Bay. I'm Dr. Zezowitz, and I'd like to introduce our esteemed Dean of USF Health, Dr. Charles Lockwood. Thank you, Dr. Zezrowitz. <laughs> Denardo. <laughs> um, well, good evening. I'm Charlie Lockwood. I'm Dean of the Morsani College of Medicine and Senior Vice President for USF Health. Um, welcome to CAMELS, uh, our wonderful medical simulation center, um, which is now about six years old. Um, and if you look out the window someplace in that general vicinity, you will see the new medical school and Heart Institute, which is now, I think, on the 12th floor of Plan 13 floors um, and will be opened next winter. Um, and we're very, very excited to be down here near our primary partner, uh, Tampa General Hospital. So welcome to Tampa and welcome to Camels and welcome to USF. Um, and also uh, welcome everyone, as well as those watching online from around the globe, to the 10th annual USF Health and Friedrich Sataxia Research Alliance Scientific Symposium, Understanding a Cure. Joining us tonight are dedicated researchers and skilled clinicians, industry partners, patients, caregivers uh, in the Friedrich Sataxia community, our colleagues and friends from FARA and all who share passion and commitment to finding effective treatments, therapies, and a cure for Friedrich's ataxia and related disorders. We've come together tonight to discuss not only trans translational research advances in Friedrich's ataxia, but to hear from individual patient perspectives and the view of industry leaders. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't thank a number of folks, starting with Ron Bartek, uh, the president and founder of FARA, Jennifer Farmer, Executive Director of FARA, and other team members of the FARA organization, Dr. Cliff Gooch, uh, the USF Health Morsani College of Medicine Chair of Neurology, <laughs> so uh, the, the Director of the USF Health Ataxia Center, uh, Paul, and uh, I, Suzanne I don't think is here yet, hopefully she will be, uh, Avery, whose tremendous generosity and unwavering support for finding a cure for Friedrich's Ataxia is truly extraordinary. FARA's many donors, um, who are raising awareness and supporting uh, the annual energy ball that will be on Saturday night, our world-class researchers, scientific and industry partners, and most of all, patients and their families who are joining us tonight uh, in person uh, and on online. I am very proud of the relationship we have with FARA and the USF Health Ataxia Center. Now in its 10th year, uh, our Ataxia Center is led by Dr. Jesuits, uh, is, who I'm getting much better with my Polish is one of the most uh, uh, provides uh, one of the most active sites for Friedrich's Ataxia clinical research trials in the world and provides advanced multidisciplinary care, including neurology, physical therapy, exercise physiology, and cardiology, as well as outreach, patient, and family support. And thank you, Dr. Z, for all you do. Um, also, USF Health is proud to be one of 11 sites in the Friedrich's Ataxia Collaborative Clinical Research Network, an international network of clinical research centers that work together to advance treatments and clinical care for those living with Friedrich's Ataxia. We're also proud to participate in the Friedrich's Ataxia Patient Registry, the only worldwide registry containing demographic and clinical information on more than 2,000 patients. Since 2008, this symposium continues to be a major annual event broadcasted around the world. And tonight, you will learn much about each individual investigator's research progress, and we will meet a dynamic patient panel who will share their own perspectives on research. I want to thank, again, everyone involved in this uh, really, truly fascinating and, I think, exciting scientific symposium. Um, we, uh, speaking for USF, for Farah and for all the investigators, we'll never stop looking for answers and we'll never stop looking for a cure. And finally, I hope to see all of you at the 10th annual Farah Energy. Thank you for being here. Um, Dr. Lockwood thanked everyone and um, we want to again thank Farah and all the people in Tampa Bay community. 
Um, we also want to dedicate our symposium to very special family and all of our patients, and that's Paul and Suzanne Avery. Paul is here. Paul and Suzanne, you have dedicated your lives to finding a cure for this devastating disease. You've shared your vision, your energy, your resources with the Friedrichs Taxi community and Tampa Bay. And we promise you that we will not stop until we find a cure for this horrific disease. So thank you again. Uh, the USFA Taxi Research Center, thanks to your generous support and Rafera, we continue to do groundbreaking research. And the goal, of course, is to find a cure for Friedrichs Ataxia. This is our 10th year. We lost one year due to Hurricane Irma. I know. But we started in uh, USF Morsani Center in a small classroom with only 53 seats, and it was standing room only. And people were outside, and we said, you know, we've got to find a bigger space. You could see Dr. Gooch on the bottom there. People were crowding around, taking notes, and, and then we grew into a big symposium. So just two minutes, quick primer for those of us who are following today on YouTube Live who do not know what Friedrich's ataxia is. Uh, Friedrich's ataxia is a rare genetic condition. It is a progressive degenerative disease that affects children, adolescents, and young adults. It affects one in 50,000 people, but you may be surprised to know that about one in 100 of us are carriers. Um, and it affects kids when they're about to go to college, you know, decide on a future, that this is the last thing that a child really needs to deal with in their childhood and adolescent years. I won't get into all the science, but the clinical features of Friedrichs, there's a part of the brain called the cerebellum. It's affected by Friedrichs and also the tracks coming from the cerebellum down through the spinal cord and also sensory neurons, dorsal root ganglion. In plain layman's terms, it causes incoordination, imbalance, problems with speech, problems with reflexes, and other parts of the body. But the problem really with Friedrich's ataxia is it's just not a neurologic disease. It affects other parts of the body. And one of the major parts of the body is the heart. It causes cardiomyopathy or a thick heart. And patients get problems with arrhythmias. Um, also diabetes, it affects diabetes about 10 to 20% of people. Scoliosis, which problem with the spine. These patients have fatigue. They have hearing loss, vision loss, et cetera. So it affects the entire body. Friedrich's ataxia is due to a homozygous expansion of the guanine adenine adenine trinucleotide repeat on intron 1 of the frataxin gene of chromosome 9Q13. This intron expansion leads to a pathologically suppressed amount of a small mitochondrial protein that is very important. It's called frataxin. There are some uh, Friedrich's ataxy patients that are in homozygous. They have trinucleotide repeats on one allele and a point mutation or deletion on the other, and they look a little bit different than a typical Friedrich's ataxia patient. We call that the point mutation patients. But frataxin is an essential protein, and it functions in the mitochondria. If you look at what we named our symposium, it's called Understanding Energy for the Cure because the mitochondria is involved in energy. It's involved in power. It's a power generator for the cell. And very easy, if you don't have enough for taxin, you have problems with iron sulfur cluster assembly. Downstream, you've got problems with mitochondrial function and cell death and uh, dysfunction. So it's a problem. Right here, though, on this slide, you can see that on the left, the controls have 100% for taxin, right? you can see that patients have small amounts of frataxin. But in the middle, you could see that carriers of Friedrich's ataxia gene have 50% frataxin. Well, this is a genetic disease. Mom carries a gene, dad carries a gene. They're asymptomatic, right? But they don't have full levels of frataxin. Why is this important? Well, if we're trying to increase frataxin in patients, we don't need to get to 100%. We need to get to a certain level that will make them functional and fun function correctly. Okay. In just two minutes, Friedrich's ataxia research that we're doing here, we're working on the FA comms clinical outcome measure study. Natural history is very important in Friedrich's ataxia. When you have a rare disease, it's hard to get 500 people or 200 people in a clinical trial. So it's very important for all of you at home, if you're not registered in the, uh, with FARA, it's important to do so, so that we can follow you in a natural history study. We're also part of the Collaborative Clinical Research Network in Friedrich's Ataxia. And we're involved in some of the great drug trials, like MOXIE, and that's by Riata. 
and also Takedam in adults with Friedrich's ataxia, and you'll be hearing more about that as time goes on. I quickly want to thank the members of my team. It takes a village to have this great research. Um, if you could just come say hello, Jessica Shaw, Mary Freeman, Alvin Lackdow, uh, Kelvin Fenelon, Danny Eckberg, Joshua Vega, Maggie McGriff, Louis Lozano, it's a big team, Sarah Chung, Shauna Diaz, Melissa Polzer, and Casey Ketterer. Also, uh, Huni Kim, Dr. Kim works in our Gate and Balance Center, does great research. Dr. Artie Patel is also working with us. Artie, if you stand up, and she's heading up our clinical uh, cardiac center for Friedrich's ataxia. Marcus Kilpatrick works with exercise physiology. Dr. Cliff Gooch, chair of neurology. I forgot the why, I'm sorry. Yeah, and is Melissa here? Okay, Jessica Shaw is our clinical administrator. Jessica, if you come over here. She's been our clinical administrator for eight years and uh, she had big shoes to fill and she's going on to live in London with her husband. And Jessica, we wanna thank you for your dedication and your warmth and everything you have done to make this center a really strong center. We're gonna miss you, but you know, life moves on. So thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next, we'll have our patient panel um, with Felicia DeRosa from Friedrich's Ataxia Research Alliance and some wonderful Friedrich's Ataxia patients. Good evening. Uh, I'm Felicia DeRosa. I'm the Fundraising and Communications Program Director at FARA. And um, I've been with FARA for 10 and a half years. And oftentimes I get asked how I got introduced to the organization, a family, uh, a family that I choose. And I think with this panel, you'll quickly see why. Um, just a little overview for the rest of the evening. Uh, we have structured this purposefully to be a panel of people living with FA, uh, the FARA uh, team, uh, so different perspectives from team members at FARA, the advocacy organization, and then our researchers. And what we hope happens this evening is that you see how each of these groups, um, the representatives from these groups this evening, are getting us closer to treatments and a cure. And not only that, but that you also see your role in this, because this is really a team effort. This is really a team journey. So without further ado, I am going to uh, be your moderator for the girl power portion of the evening. <laughs> We're giving Zeppelin a pass <laughs> on our panel. Um, and we'll start with introductions. So I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to give a quick introduction, their name, their age, where they're from, and um, just a quick fun fact. Hi, I'm Laura Avery. I am 23 years old. I'm from Tampa, Florida, and I am currently getting my master's in entrepreneurship at UT. So Laurel, yeah. yes, definitely wonderful. Can you tell us a little bit about this photo behind us? So I just graduated undergrad in May. So um, on my left is the president, President Vaughn. Uh, there's Mr. Rothschild, a good friend of ours who helped walk me across stage and I'm very appreciative of that day and my dad behind me. So it was a team effort, but I made it across the stage and got my diploma. So. And can you quickly tell us a little bit about your, um, your studies in graduate school? Mm -hmm. So I am studying right now to get my master's of science in entrepreneurship. Um, I just started uh, end of August, so it's been very interesting. I graduate in a year, so it's a very intense program. Everything's kind of packed together, but I've enjoyed it so far and everything that's, that I've taken. Great. Thank you, Laura. I'm Sam Hill. I'm 14, and I'm from Annapolis, Maryland. Um, and I really like to read. Okay, can you tell us? Well, actually, we have this photo. It looks like it might be from Christmas. Yeah. Uh, was that this Christmas? Yeah. Um, and it looks like you might have a Mindy Kaling book. 
Yes. Did you did you enjoy that one? Yeah, it was really good. Um, did you know that Jamie Young, my coworker, met her? Oh, I did. You guys yeah. are gonna have to get together after <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> um, so, uh, is this representative? Do you like to read kind of biographies and comedies now? Is I that like representative? To read everything. Everything. Yeah. Okay. Um, I. I had a chance to have dinner with your folks and they were telling me that uh, you were reading Harry Potter as like a kindergartner. Yeah. <laughs> I was pretty impressed with that. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Sam. So our order got switched on our slides. So we're just going to do that. Annie, yeah. you're next. Um, I'm Annie Hamilton. I'm 14 years old, I'm from New York, and I have three siblings. Okay, let's see. Okay, I'm imagining these are your three siblings. Can you introduce us to the people in the photo? Um, I have an older sister named Catherine, and then I have an older brother named Tommy, and I have a younger sister named Gracie. And where was this photo taken? Um, it was taken on a boat in a family vacation. Nice. Was this this past summer? Yes. Okay. Now, do you all, you all look like you're getting along and having a fun time. Is that always the case? No. Because okay. <laughs> we have your dad to kind of check that in the front row, whether that's, <laughs> whether you're telling the truth or not. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, Annie. Thanks for being with us. So I'm Allison Dina. I am 39 and we live in South Carolina. This is my dog Zeppelin, in case anyone wants to know. Um, I've been married to my husband Nathan for eight years and we have six and a half year old twin girls, Addie and Emmy. And so this looks like this is your girls and making the family pilgrimage to see the mouse. Yeah, this was. <laughs> This was about a year and a half ago, probably. Um, and Emmy is the one with the huge grin on her face. <laughs> um, she loved Minnie Mouse at that point, so that was her. That was her favorite thing of the trip. That was her brush with celebrity, oh, yeah. huh? <laughs> That's great. That's great. So Dr. Z gave us some background about um, Friedrich's ataxia, just some of the bullet points you'd read online, but I'd like our panelists to each speak to something that, um, something you experienced with FA that uh, people might not think about. And uh, we'll start with Allison for this one. Um, I, yeah, yes, we have FA, but we're also very, um, as a community, we're very independent and resilient. Um, I usually will decline hours from people to help um, because I want to do it myself. And people ask, what, if, what happens if I fall? Then if I fall, I fall. I'll, I'll figure out how to get up when, when it happens. Can you um, give an example where, because I imagine in, in public you're offered help. Um, how, do you, how do you handle those situations? Um, I don't have a wheelchair van, so it happens all the time that people offer to help me. Because I lift my shirt in and out of the car, take it apart, put it back together. Um, but you know, if, I, if we really do need help, like the chair won't go together for some reason, then I will, of course, accept it. But you know, usually, I, for one thing, people tend to not realize how heavy the chair is, and they sort of throw it in, and things could get damaged. Um, but also, um, but also. I can do it myself. I can do it myself. I and I, I appreciate the help, but I can do it. No, I think that's a good lesson. No, I think that's a good lesson to honor independence and not make assumptions. Not make assumptions. So thank you for that. Annie, how about you? Annie, how about you? Some people might not know about FA. Um, my um, my feet are very sensitive. <laughs> sensitive. So is it so sensitive is it sensitive to temperature to or temperature touch? or touch or um, it oh. doesn't matter if it's hot or cold, but whenever I'm walking in bare feet, whether it's on like a sidewalk or like gravel, my feet just can't take it. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard that from other people mm -hmm. as well. I think Kyle has like a spare pair of Uggs in our office that he, mm -hmm. he sports in the winter time because his feet are, always get cold. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, Sam, how about you? Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that I get tired really easily and all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so what would be an example of, of that? Like, um, what's a typical day like for you? Just, I go to school and I get home and start doing my homework and I just like fall asleep halfway through because I'm just so tired yeah. from the day. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard that. I've heard that from other folks too. So then, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Moral. Um, I think for me, when I first started college, um, I actually just got my scooter when I started school, and people automatically thought that I needed help with everything I was doing, that I couldn't do anything. And I think that was a misconception that we are, as a community, as Dallas said, everyone's very independent and tries really hard to be resilient and strong. and. I think people had to learn that, but it was often led to many questions and unsure things about kind of what I was capable of. Yeah. You had said to me once, someone said, asked you if it affected your brain. Yeah. And <laughs> um, how did you respond to that? I had a friend that asked me that one time, and I mean, I was just like, uh, no. <laughs> um, but I mean, after, obviously, I'm, I went to college, and... It, I pr think I proved myself, but um, I and then I got did. involved in college, and people I think didn't. No one's asked me that since, so <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> I think that is a good thing. Well, thank you all for sharing that. I think that's probably stuff that doesn't come up necessarily in a list of symptoms. Or um, so we are um, joined by clinicians and researchers here today. If you could tell them one thing you would like to fix about FA. What would that? What would that be? Sam, we'll go to you first for this one. Um, I think. I mean, obviously, I'd like everything to be fixed as fast as possible. But um, you hear I, that? Get working. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if I had to choose one thing, it would probably be just my everyday like balance problems because um, it like affects me. Every day, it's fixing the It it affects me every day, like constant. Yeah, it's daily. I guess it's all the time. In balance. Yeah. Uh, floral. Oh, I don't know. Yours might be okay. Hello. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, um. I just said very generic. I would like fix everything. There's not one specific thing. I think FA as a whole needs to be fixed, and I'm ready for that day. And not just one thing, fix everything. <laughs> as your mom says, cure yeah. FA now, now. <laughs> um, Annie. Um, if I could fix one thing, it would be the walking, but like the progression of the walking. Because it's really hard for me when I like go to do something and I can't do it anymore, and it's like hard to know that you're like getting worse. Yeah. So the adapting to change. Yeah. yeah that's significant. Yeah. That's yeah. a that's a good one to call to call attention to. Allison. Uh, my girls would say they want mommy to be able to walk again. Thank you for that. Um, so over the last 12 months, uh, Farah has been putting out a lot of requests to participate in research, whether that's um, some of the clinical trials that Dr. Z has mentioned, or um, some of the clinical studies, some of the biomarker studies. And uh, each person on this panel has graciously offered their time to travel and be part of studies. And um, I'd just like each of them to share some of that with you because they're, they're, taking time, they're doing their part. Uh, taking time out of their school and work and family life schedules to be part of these studies. And um, it, sometimes those studies, you, you're helping, just helping the greater good. It's they're the, some of the biomarker studies. And we have the biomarker meeting tomorrow. We have some of the biomarker scientists here today. So if you can share a little bit about your, your why, 
what studies you participated in and, and, and why you feel it's important to participate in research. So I'm currently in my fourth study and um, I, I personally really um, enjoy being in the study. It's very kind of unknown. Um, you don't know if you're on placebo or on the drug, but even though it may be frustrating, I think it's good for research purposes to be able to participate and kind of extend myself. And for those that may not be able to, just knowing that I can make an impact because I'm able to do these and be in the area and do what I can to help, just knowing that it will further help myself and others in research is really great to know for myself. Can you tell people a little bit about either what a typical visit for a clinical trial looks like or maybe one of the tests you have to do? Because, you know, we say clinical trials broadly, but I'm not sure everybody necessarily knows what that involves. So, for right now, for example, I wake up early, I go do a bike test, and then I go see Dan, and Dan Eckford, I don't know where it's at, but I saw you earlier. Um, <laughs> And then we do peg tests, we do a bunch of different tests, and just kind of ask what's going on, I give them an update, and it's, it goes pretty smoothly. So it's a fun morning. Yeah, that's <laughs> <your seat>? yeah. <laughs> um, can you, tell, you mentioned a bike test. Can you tell us a little bit what that looks like? So um, the unique thing about this test is you have to keep up a certain speed and maintain that speed that you want. So it's very interesting to have to do that and uh, being, I've been at a ton of ride taxis, thanks to Kyle, I love them. Um, but I love my bike and I think being able to do that has helped me maintain that strength and I've just continued to ride and then when I'm done I let them know that I'm getting tired or they know that I've slowed down and it's just, yeah. <laughs> So one of the, the measure you're describing this bike test is your ability to, to do the work, to yeah. have that work output and see if that, that changes. Yeah. So I just think that's an interesting thing. I mean, it's a real life, you know, biking is a real life thing and mm -hmm. it's a way to measure yeah. uh, for this trial, one of the ways to measure for this trial. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Laura. No problem. Um, Sam. So I participated in two or three different studies and when I was first diagnosed, um, we it was never really like, oh, maybe we should try doing a study. It was more of like a, this is, I, well, for me, I was like, this is what we're going to do now because I want to do anything I can to help myself and everyone else. Thank you, Sam. Um, I just wanted to have a follow-up question because you've done some of the biomarker tests in Rochester. You yeah. went from Annapolis three is it three times? Yes. And, and your sister went as well um, yeah. to Rochester. What were some of um, some of the tests you did? Um, we did, had to get sk like skin biopsies. How was that? Really painful. Oh. Oh. Um, <laughs> Thank you for doing it. Yeah, and then we also had to and then we also had to do nerve tests. conduction tests. Or else it's not. Or not else not, not fun. Okay, you're really not selling. Okay, you're really not selling. Okay, you're really not selling. <laughs> <laughs> but I like your honesty. But I like your honesty. But you still did it, and you stuck with yeah. it, and we applaud yeah. that. So, um, so and you did that. You did that three times, yes. and they were measuring how maybe how it was changed, how things might have been changing yeah. for you over time. Yeah. Yeah. Really important. So, remember Sam tomorrow when you're working in, um, in that biomarker meeting, everyone. Thank you. Um, we're going to uh, jump over to Allison, because I know you just, you just came from a biomarker study. Yeah, about five hours ago. <laughs> um, I'm in the, the biomarker study at UF. Um, I just completed my fourth visit, so I've been in there for two years. Um, it's a five-year five study, go once every six months approximately, um, and basically they study progression. Um, and they are, we're trying to find better ways to measure progression, um, which is why it's six months long, or it's five years long, sorry. Um, so visits are usually one to two days, um, and they 
do lots of things like a cardiac MRI and a pegboard and echo. Um, but they also do what's called a motor control test, which most people have never heard of. Um, it's really hard. It takes a lot of concentration. Um, basically, they strap your left foot into this machine, uh, put some electrodes on your, on your leg, and you have a computer screen in front of you with a, it's really hard to explain, so I'm sorry if <laughs> not clear. Um, they, you have a computer screen in front of you with a graph that signifies timing and intensity of movement and a little box on the graph. And then you move your toes to see if you can make the line from the timing and intensity go in the box. I'm kind of proud of myself because I did eight times today. I've never ever done before. So, sorry, I wasn't sure whether we had this slide or not, yeah, but we do. Time. So yeah, was this from today? Yeah. So, um, excellent. Is this so the target? So the, the blue line. Uh -huh. um, if your a little circle, yep. that's the peak of it. Obviously. Oh, wait, I think I have a pointer. Ah, there we go. Okay. I can join the biomarker meeting tomorrow now. <laughs> so it's called the motor control test. Um, the, um, the timing is the bottom. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and the intensity of the movement is, is on the side. Mm -hmm. So you're moving your toes um, to try and to make the graph line go in the box. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. <laughs> and it looks like you did it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Allison. And Annie, you want to tell us a little bit about your thoughts on, on trials and your experience? Um, I participate in all the research I can, but a lot of the studies I'm too young for, but I participate in the natural history study. So you've done the pegboard a time or two. Yeah. So pegboard for people who don't know is a, a nine hole test with uh, pegs that you have to get into the board and then take them out. Um, so measuring fine motor control. Um, and I don't hear all that, people aren't all that excited about it, but everybody does it, so we're really grateful for that. And you know, what Annie mentioned is a lot of times um, companies make, either need to or want to make a decision to, um, in the interest of safety, to do studies in um, an older population in adults. And um, so a lot of times our younger people who are affected aren't um, el eligible for the study. So it just highlights a need to get uh, treatments approved so they're available for everybody. So, Thanks, Annie. All right, so for our last question, um, I'd like to go back to a little bit more about you. If each of you can share with us a personal accomplishment you're most proud of. Uh, Laurel, we'll start with you. Well, I already talked about my accomplishment, but I'm <laughs> proud of being able to go get my master's and going back. Um, I'm actually the first person in my in the Avery family to get a master. So, <laughs> where's your dad? She's gunning for your job. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> graduate school different than, than undergrad? Um, I think the big difference is that it's only a year long, so everything's kind of compiled together. Um, we have courses throughout the year, so I have summer classes in winter and fall, spring, yeah. everything, so I'm in class the entire time, not many vacations. Um, but Everyone that I'm in class with right now will be in my class the entire time that I'm in class. So we've really gotten to know each other and like kind of have a good group of friends and good bond. We've good, done a lot of like bonding trips and go to football games. Uh, so it's yeah. been fun. Yeah, have study groups. And, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we <Wait>. study too. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to plug that in there, Dad. <laughs> How about you, 
Yeah. Um, I think mm -hmm. I'm most proud of just keeping up with school and like I work really hard just at school and just keeping up with that even though I'm always just so tired all the time. Just yeah. I'm really proud of how I manage that. Do you have a favorite favorite subjects in school? Um, I like math and science. And yeah. What about it? Um, I just like getting answers and solving problems. Yeah. Do you? I know college is a ways off, yeah. but do you know what you might want to study? Is I don't. Time, 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 I don't time, know. <laughs> math and science and solving problems. I don't know. Okay. I, don't know I think you got time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Annie, something you're most proud of? Um, last year, I was elected president of my middle school, oh, and yeah. I was really proud of that. Congratulations. Was there um, something during um, your term that you were particularly proud of, maybe some positive change in the school you were able to foster? Um, I got rid of homework in some classes. <laughs> I bet that made you very popular. <laughs> Delivering on some campaign promises. <laughs> Thanks, Annie. Hi, Allison. Um, I'm most proud of my girls and how would they treat other people that, are, that look and act a little bit different than they are? Mm. Definitely something that we need. Well, those are all the questions I have for the panelists. I'm just going to do a quick try. Oh, we have a few minutes, um, which is, yay team. See, we're efficient. Yay, girl power. Um, we have a few minutes to take questions from the audience if there are any. If not, we'll just we'll move on to... Um, the advocacy panel. Oh, yeah, in the back. I'm really interested to know how you girls handle your, your schoolwork and writing assignments. Um, you know, all of the apps that you know about and all the, just how do you handle it? Could you repeat the question? Yeah, I'll repeat the question just so everybody can hear online as well. The question was, um, how everybody handles uh, schoolwork and writing assignments, and are there apps or tricks or things that you use? Um, it's not as much as an issue in college. Um, we're able to use our laptop, so I'm not writing as often. Um, so there are note tiers that I can um, request. I can also to request many different options, having someone to work with me. Um, I'm very close with the disability lady at my school, so she is very open to discussing with me what I'm interested in. So I think having that good connection kind of it's helpful in the sense that I can am comfortable expressing what I need. That's great. That's great. So both electronic and people resources. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my my school really helps me out a lot and they give me a lot of accommodations. If I can't write, they let me type on like my exams and my tests, which helps me with schoolwork a lot. That's good. Um, my school also gives me a lot of accommodations. Um, for tests, I usually get extra time if I'm writing them. And then a lot of times they let me type it, or I can have someone scribe it for me. And then for my homework, my sometimes my parents will do it with me. Mm -hmm. I know it's a little time I graduated since school. from college in two thousand one. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, girls, thank you, relate. But but you're repeating the process over again. I Imagine if you have six-year-olds, you're yes. starting homework all over again. Yes. How's, well, how's that six-year-old math? <laughs> first graders don't have homework. So. Oh, okay. Uh, well, it's just a matter of time. <laughs> if we had one more question. Yeah, I'll just ask. Um, 
So the question is, um, uh, a member of the audience has had some um, issues with discrimination or, or harassment due to uh, Friedrichs. And has anybody on the panel experienced that and how, how you approach the situation? Not just Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, so my opinion is people oftentimes do have very different approaches and people do stare and ask weird questions a lot. I get that a lot and I fortunately have a really good great group of friends that um, thankfully are still with me after college and kind of I see them, but it's not a large group of friends. It's more of like a couple good friends that I have. And I think that what I tend to do is when people say those things, I tend to look at more of the things in my life that are positive, like what has been good this day? What has been more impactful? Who is my good friend? These people tend to, I don't tend to give them much like in my head think about that much, um, what they're thinking. They have their own stuff going on and they shouldn't impact you. And I personally don't let them bother me. But if Josh ever wants to talk, I mean, I, I would talk to him. <laughs> So, yeah, just to repeat that, um, Josh, who's in the audience, shared that when he was walking that a lot of times, um, not even just pedestrians, but police officers thought he was drunk um, just due to his ataxia. And I know um, some of the clinicians in the network have written letters. I mean, I know you're not going to necessarily want to carry a letter on you all the time. Um, so it's not a full solution, but, or like uh, some people, I think in the ambassador group have, um, you know, carried cards that just explain a little bit about Friedrichs. It's unfortunate that you have to be the educator, that you have to experience that. Yeah, but um, I mean, those are some of the things that I've heard that people in the community have done because I unfortunately have heard other people have experienced that. All right, I think we're at our time, but our panelists will be around after if you want to ask them things one-on-one. -on -one. So thank you to everyone for sharing. Okay, we're going to have our advocacy organizational panel with uh, Herman Fernandez, Ron Bartek, President of FARA, Dr. Sande Bidi Chandani, and Pat Richel. Good evening. My name is Herman Fernandez. I was with Southern Wine and Spirits for 44 years. I just retired three months ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been involved and will be the moderator I've been involved with Farah from day one, but I've, I will be the moderator tonight for th these three distinguished gentlemen. Over a decade ago, I have been in the, a very close friend of Paul Avery for 30 years. Uh, he called me to his office at Outback Steakhouse, and I went to his office, and at that time he talked to me about what they had just received about Laurel. And it was devastating, but we sat and talked about many things with our families and talked about what's the next steps, and we needed to find out so much. And that began the task. What drives me is the fact that I love the Avery family and have known them for a long, long time. And I will do everything I can in our power to get to where we need to be, and seeing how we've grown the last 10 years has been just incredible. So, tonight, these three gentlemen are so nice to have such talent on the stage with me, because <laughs> I have such a great scientific background, yeah. selling alcoholic beverage, <clears throat> wine and spirits. <laughs> I don't know why I'm really here, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, I want to welcome all three of you, 
And you've all been part of the FARA, FARA team, and you've been an integral part of it. And you're dedicated, you're involved, your personal lives in every way possible, and everyone differently. We have a limited window of time today, so we will move fast. Uh, I'd like you to introduce yourself and to say a little bit about yourself, and then I will begin the questions, and we'll go in the same order throughout the evening. So, Sanjay, you go first. So, so I'm Sanjay Bidi Chandani, um, also a complicated name, so just like they say Dr. Z, I'm called Dr. B. Um, so I'm a professor and head of genetics at the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine. Um, I'm also scientific director at FARA. Um, and I've been involved in FA for many years. I was lucky when I was doing my postdoc fellowship in the mid-90s to meet the Massimo Pandolfo, who was talking about the mic earlier today. He's the one who led the team that found the gene for FA. And you know, it's something most people don't realize that until that time, there wasn't a definitive way to tell that you had FA. And so there were many people who had FA at that time who didn't have a clue they had FA. And so after the gene was found, obviously a genetic test was available. And that's when we started to really recognize the breadth of clinical features that people with FA have. So you saw so many people sitting up on stage and, and you could have all kinds of versions of FA and that became clear when the diagnostic test became available. Shortly after that, Fertaxin was discovered, the connection with mitochondria was discovered, some of the things that Dr. Zizwitz was telling us um, you know, earlier. Um, and, and what I can say is that from the start of when the gene was found till today, all the discoveries, all of those discoveries are now nodes or targets for therapies that are being developed today that you will hear about tomorrow and, and later on today. That's terrific. He's also clairvoyant because he answered my question before I got a chance to answer it <laughs> about the identifying the gene. So that's a talent that I didn't know you had. <laughs> Ron Bartek, go ahead. So I'm uh, <clears throat> Ron Bartek, um, along with my wife Rachel, I'm the co-founder of the Friedrich Detection Research Alliance and have always served as its president. Um, we decided uh, it was time for, for FARA when in uh, 1997 our son Keith at age 11 was diagnosed with this uh, rare condition and uh, we got from the doctor uh, a very tough prognosis. We knew Keith was going to get pretty sick pretty fast and um, so we sat down at our uh, computer and searched around and saw there was very little science going on there was no treatment uh, there were no drug companies involved there were no clinical trials uh, there was no organization devoted entirely to supporting the research in Friedrich's ataxia so there we were living in the Washington DC area and both working in Congress and we said well maybe we're at the right time and the right place to uh, establish a foundation that could raise enough awareness and funding to make a difference. So we set out to do that, uh, founded the organization in 1998, uh, started raising uh, money and um, started funding some basic research to figure out what this disease was like, what caused it, and what might be some therapeutic approaches in the future. We started funding basic research, therefore. We also started assembling to, to grow the field. We, we hosted the, at the NIH the world's first international scientific conference on FA the following year in 1998. Uh, we also started exploring at the NIH um, some people who might support our cause. So, and we also started trying to build. We found patients didn't know each other. They were isolated and alone. Uh, and hopeless. There was no reason to hope. There was very little research going on. So we started uh, trying to build communications with those patients, introducing them to one another, introducing them to FARA and, and that there was hope on the way, and started um, building that, that hope and, and with our wonderful scientists. The good news we got that night when we saw the bad news was the gene had been identified almost a year to the day earlier, as Sanjay just described, and that's been the building block, as Sanjay indicated, of all the progress that's been made since. Thank you, Ron. Pat, let me ask you a specific question. Uh, you have two daughters that were diagnosed with FA in 2013. Uh, tell us about the FAIR organization and what it meant to you, when you, you and your family, when you discovered what you 
sure. we're dealing with. Yeah, so I two girls with FA, and uh, we were diagnosed in 2013. And I, I know many of you have your own uh, diagnosis story, but it took us, uh, you know, over a year, maybe almost two, uh, to get to the diagnosis of, of FA. And uh, when we were diagnosed, uh, we were, I guess, by luck of geography, uh, living outside of Philadelphia, about 20 miles from where uh, where Fair is located, and you know, about 30 miles from CHOP, which is a, a center of excellence for for FA. Uh, you know, one of the first things that uh, we did was go up to the Farrell offices and sit down with uh, Jen Farmer and, uh, and Kyle and Felicia and others and just try to understand what was going on. Um, certainly we spent a lot of time on the internet, uh, you know, trying to do our own research, but we went up and, and learned you know, right then face to face what was going on. And at that point the organization that uh, Ron and, and others had built up was already very capable. Uh, in 2013, they had a, a, an established natural history study ongoing. They had a patient registry, uh, a very broad network of uh, researchers, both domestically and, and across the globe in Europe, Australia, uh, and, and really very impressive from a, a handful of, of folks that were working on it to leverage that across uh, you know, dozens to hundreds uh, even of people. And uh, clinical trials were underway um, at, at that point as well. And, and so it was really, uh, I think, comforting for us to see that this organization existed. A lot of these things had already been put in place. And so uh, I thought, you know, how can I help out? And my background is not as a, a, a researcher or a scientist or a doctor. Um, I spent my you know, 20 years in industry. And I thought maybe I could help a little bit on the uh, commercial side of things and trying to get uh, other companies, uh, other institutions, other organizations uh, involved in the space and try to grow that network of, of companies that are working in the FA space. And so that's what I've spent the last you know, five years or so doing. Thank you, Ben. Okay, the next question, the same question for all three of you. I'm sure their perspectives will be different. But as an advocacy organization, give me your view on the primary role in contribution, education, or in the research process. Um, so, you know, at FARA, we've uh, always believed, even from the outset when Ron was mentioning when FARA was started, we've always believed that high quality research is the way to figure out what's wrong in FA and to come. on that one mm -hmm. um, and and but we also recognize that having junior and senior investigators be in the space and, and bring in some bright minds and so some of our granting programs are designed to bring new people and keep them in our field um, one of the other things and Ron has been a major proponent of this which is collaborations so when you share ideas and you you talk about things you do that even before it's published and so that way you get to share resources and ideas before it gets too late and you can actually do things pretty fast so some of our grants are actually designed to be collaborative grants and that's the way we right. fund those uh, but we also organize scientific conferences um, and, and smaller bigger and smaller meetings where we actually encourage people to meet and, and talk to each other to stimulate this kind of you know cross fertilization and if you can just add one more thing um, what we also do at FARA is to identify certain areas where we need to do some really hot research in so for example um, you know when we met with the FDA and and you know, just recognizing through our industry partners that we were not doing that great a job on developing biomarkers. Okay, so I remember two years ago when we had our first little biomarker meeting, we had, I don't know, maybe 10 people there that came up with some early ideas and it was a really quick meeting. Um, but then tomorrow we're going to have a whole day and we're going to have 25 plus speakers, everybody talking about biomarker development in all kinds of aspects of FA. And so this was one way in which Farah was able to galvanize the community to say, this is an important area, we're all going to come and bang our heads together and make this happen. And we've done that for some other things also, but I think that's one of the ways in which Farah brings um, uh, you know, uh, therapies closer to, to, to fruition. Great. Okay. Um, that was a great presentation, um, a very important aspects, Sanjay. Um, I'd say our primary role as FARA is based upon the realization from the get-go that we couldn't do it by ourselves. There was no way this little organization 
was going to be able to accomplish all the, the wonderful things that would be needed to develop a treatment and a cure for this disease. We knew we'd have to collaborate, therefore, and build the relationships with, first and foremost, our patients and their families. And that remains the foundation of everything we do. Um, but also with the academic investigators that, that we came to know by assembling them for the first time. <coughs> excuse me, for the first time. And with the um, government partners at the NIH, the FDA, and the uh, Congress. Um, and with the industry partners that, that Pat has been so helpful in developing. Um, we, we knew we had to change um, the, the notion that they were all in it for themselves to the notion that this is all a family. FA, with our encouragement, FA research has become a family affair and every one of those stakeholders is now a member of the family. And this includes other advocacy organizations, by the way. We, we, draw, we draw the line, the biggest circle we can around anybody who's at all interested in advancing the research in FA, and that includes other advocacy organizations as well. We're learning from other advocacy organizations, for example, about biomarkers. So that's the environment we've built, and we've built it too by providing the tools and the relationships that each one of those stakeholders needs. And you know, uh, Pat mentioned that we've got the world's largest patient registry, we've got the world's largest natural history database, uh, uh, the largest clinical network, and uh, we fully collaborate with the similar network in, in Europe. And um, so all those tools are, are the ones that all of our partners need. And so the, the, the atmosphere of collaboration has been built to such an extent that we like to say, collaboration is Farah's middle name. Our full name is collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. So, <laughs> and we also like to say, as you've heard us say before, that we knew from the beginning and still the case that acting alone, there's very little we can accomplish. While acting together, there's very little we will not accomplish. And by the way, patients in this room, as you heard, have been instrumental and patients online and patients around the world have been instrumental. They're the fundamental reason we've got the world's largest registry and the world's most active and largest natural history database that all our other partners are using to design effective clinical trials that will lead to the treatment and the cure. So thank you all. Thanks, Ron. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> so, uh, Thanks, Rat. That was the uh, slowest uh, to a tear <laughs> I've ever done. Is that true? I think it's the uh, there's, so there's some parts of the, the country that Ron is known as a town crier. Yeah. But, uh, sure. uh, we love that. We absolutely love it. We love him. 20 year anniversary, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Congratulations. Right. Thank you. So uh, I'll talk about it from a little bit different perspective. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think an advocacy group can do is to remove roadblocks uh, that, that other organizations could experience. And so when, when we try to get new companies involved in the space, they, they are always asking themselves, you know, what, if I get in this space, you know, can I actually create a medicine and drive it all the way through to approval? And so there are, there are a variety of things that can block that, right? Uh, can I recruit patients in a trial? Can I run a trial? Do I have enough information and understanding of the disease? Are there biomarkers, as, as we just talked about? Is there a registry or a means to recruit patients? Are there sufficient models of disease, whether it be uh, cell lines or whether it be mouse models or other uh, uh, modeling uh, systems? Uh, so all these things are, are things that are thought about by different companies when they think about, do I want to be in this FA space? And one of the things that we can do through funding research, both at the basic level to understand the disease, at the clinical level to establish sites at which we can run trials, uh, through biomarker initiatives to help us measure progress or measure changes in response to drug interventions. All these things, when we aggregate those together, uh, create a, a body of work that a company can say, yeah, FA is very attractive to us because we can do this and the way forward is, is not unclear. Uh, there, there is a path to the clinic, there is a path to approval, and by spending our efforts to remove some of those barriers, uh, we attract more people to work in this space. And I think that, that that's something that all advocacy groups can aspire to do and something that I think, you know, Ron, Sanjay, uh, Jen, and everybody who's been involved has done a really good job over the, the past years in, in 
assembly. Very and good. As, as Ron mentioned, that's the registry, okay. clinical trial sites, mm -hmm. natural history okay. study, right. and, and onwards. Okay. All right, the final question. This is to all three of you. Uh, the Tampa community has been giving to the Energy Ball in many, in many wonderful events. Primarily, the Energy Ball is a monster, but so many events in the Bay Area. Uh, and thanks to many people in this room. Uh, how has the support changed Ferris capacity and the research landscape? This involvement. Yeah, so I mean, the Tampa community has been absolutely phenomenal for um, the FA field in general. So, um, you know, obviously, we've heard some of the great things going on here at USF. Dr. Zizowitz told us, Dr. Lockwood <coughs> told us about this. Um, basically, there's so many programs going on here, but then you also heard that it's not that easy for patients to be involved in some of these studies. Mm -hmm. These take all day. Some of these things are pretty challenging. Just to come to the place and get involved in this is difficult. And so, you know, whenever you have a site that's doing trials and studies like this, it's the families in that area that have to step up and actually be the second part of that, uh, you know, team. Mm -hmm. and, and the Tampa community has done that in an amazing way. Um, a little shout out to the people at UF. I mean, that's not too far from here. Floridians in general are doing a great job for us. There you go. Um, um, and, and of course, we have the Avery family and their friends and everybody who give you know, in, in such generous manners, and that's what actually allows us to have this robust research portfolio and this, you know, huge spectrum of therapeutic, uh, you know, pipelines that we've developed at, at Farah. It's pretty much because of, of all the money and time and effort that's going into it. And a lot of it comes from the Tampa community. So thank you. Ron? Um, I'd say it's, it's really easy for me from the Farah perspective to describe the impact of the uh, Tampa area. Um, I'd say you've heard us say before that you are the flagship of our global effort, and you are. Uh, you're also the epicenter of all of our fundraising activities. Uh, and if you look at, you know, Herman was kind enough to mention that um, to, day after tomorrow is uh, Farah's 20th anniversary. Um, and uh, Saturday is the 10th anniversary of the Farah Energy Ball. And if you just go back to the year of the first energy ball, the year leading up to the first energy ball, Farah was able to fund about $900,000 of research. Most of that was basic research. Um, we had only three clinical trials ongoing at the time, and they were of compounds that at best would promise incremental improvements. Uh, none of them made it across the finish line. Um, if you fast forward to tonight, the year in which we will hold the, the 10th uh, Farah Energy Ball, uh, with your tremendous support, uh, we, will, we are projected to spend right at $7 million on, on research. That's a pretty powerful impact, I'd say. Uh, and a lot of that money came from right here. Um, I'd also say that not three clinical trials, but about six are underway at this point. Um, and one is in a phase three, the final phase of the clinical trial. You know, cross your fingers. Um, it could lead to our first approval. Um, and there are other trials that are in just behind it, phase 2B, you could call them, whatever. Um, and um, there also, it's also true that there are three strategies, three approaches to clinical trials that will start in the next few months um, that are going to uh, you know, have the potential of addressing the underlying cause of this disease, the, the, the low levels of frataxin protein. We've got um, uh, one clinical trial that should start in the next couple of months is uh, aimed at increasing the expression of the frataxin gene that's already in our patients. Uh, others are uh, designed to, that will start next year, um, which is not that far off anymore, uh, designed to um, introduce additional frataxin protein with a vehicle that takes the, to, to the mitochondria in which it works. Uh, and then we've got gene therapy trials that should be commenced next year. So these are the profoundly beneficial therapeutics that we've been uh, hoping to uh, come on board. 
and, um, and, and so you can understand how all of our patients uh, now have, have replaced their hopelessness, not only with hope, but with confidence that with your unbelievable support and generosity, we will treat, cure, and eliminate Friedrich's attacks. So thank you very much. It's always humbling yeah. to speak after Ron. <laughs> uh, I, I think that uh, you know, what, uh, clearly the, the impact of this community uh, is, has been amazing uh, for the, the whole FA space and, and FAIR in particular. Uh, I think the one thing that maybe sometimes goes underappreciated but is by, uh, by no means less important is the motivation and the sense of community that the Energy Ball and the Tampa community create. Uh, for a lot of folks that work in, uh, in, in this industry, they, they, they go to a building, they go to a lab, they do some experiments, they go home. Their interaction with patients, patient community and families is relatively limited. Mm -hmm. And when you bring those people out and into an event like the Energy Ball or some of the other things that are done down here, and they get to interact with this community and this family, uh, they leave highly motivated. Uh, they understand. They understand the meaning of their work, how impactful it can be on a personal level to each and everybody uh, that's involved with this disease. And so I think that that is is really really powerful. And I think it's something that this community has uh, has in spades and has done an, an absolutely wonderful job of. Thank you. Guys. Can, can I just add um, one important fact too? Sure. We talked about all three of us have talked about the importance of the clinical trials. Um, I, I'd say that. Uh, a good number of those clinical trials have been conducted right here at USF and a good number of the patients in this room have participated. A good number of the F Florida patients not in this room have participated uh, here at USF and we're just deeply grateful to all of you. So. Very good guys, very good. <clears throat> well in closing, just a couple of takeaways that I feel that were so important listening to each of you in a very different perspectives. Uh, FARA has evolved tremendously. It's become, it's become a, an amazing advocacy, advocacy organization. This advancement derived from collective collaboration. When I listened to Ron, I've listened to Paul over the years, collaboration was a word that was said so, so important and that it, they took it and ran with it. And bringing great medical and scientific pe minds and the people in the room, it's, it's been very exciting to be part of it, to watch it. Uh, it's led to significant progress in vital areas and bringing pe to people together in one profound purpose, and that purpose is to find the cure. Absolutely. So that's our goal, and I thank you, panel. Do we have time for questions? We have time for questions. So any questions to these three gentlemen from anyone? Did they tell you everything you need to know? How's the gene therapy coming along? Uh, you're going to hear about that. Okay. Sure. I, uh, yeah. I, I think there there are a lot of folks that are, are working in the space. Uh, I, I don't want to comment on any specific program, but I think that the the number of players in the space, the energy in the space, and I, I feel very confident that uh, that we're going to see something in you know hopefully sooner rather than later. But I, I feel that there's uh, a, a lot of folks in this space, and I feel good that you know at least one, hopefully more, of those will get across the finish line. Any other questions? I think we have a few more minutes. Yes, Mexico. Please speak up. Oh, you got a mic. Uh, you guys talked about Farah and community. Uh, so Rite Aid Taxi is a big deal. Um, I was wondering if there's any rides coming up or any new things Farah is going to be doing. <laughs> Right. <laughs> we have a right of taxi of expert right over there. Yeah. He is right of taxi. Yeah. If you haven't done that, you need to come out. We have a yeah. great time. We yeah. will be there. <laughs> and it's really, really uh, an amazing morning. Any other questions? Anyone? Here we go. Thank you. The uh, companies say deal with in, the, in regards to research for FA, are they U.S.-based or are they worldwide? We, we've had, well, why don't you answer this question? We, you, yeah. You're our industry dude. So, <laughs> so there are, yeah, uh, 
so, so they're, they're global. Uh, there, are, there are organizations throughout the world that are working on FA. Uh, the majority of them are domestic, however, I would say. And they're from the largest in the world, like Pfizer, uh, down to startups. And uh, they all come to our space because they know that Farah has prepared that space so well, that we've got the registry and the natural history and the clinical network. We've characterized the disease. We know the basic research. And we've got brilliant scientists that they want to get together with. And we've got all the assets in terms of the preclinical tools. We've got the assays, the cell and animal models, the, you know, all, all the things, that, and the blood samples. Uh, Jen Farmers, are our, our, our best vampire. She goes around the world collecting <laughs> blood samples <laughs> and, and giving them to these drug companies. Um, we do everything paperwork. we can to uh, get them across the, the starting line. So yeah. they love working with us. Kyle, last year uh, you rode in France in, in a bike ride. And uh, I know Paul and I were going to do that until we found out there was no motors on the bikes. So <laughs> changed, changed our mind very rapidly. But I know that was very successful. And uh, I hope you continue to do that as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it was really neat to, uh, to ride in France with the FA organization, with the money that we raised on that ride. And it's just another example of how we come together internationally even. To, uh, to get this thing done. Tell them about Melbourne, not Melbourne, Florida, but Melbourne, Australia. Australia. Yeah, yep. yeah, and so some of our Australian they researchers have, yeah. are in the crowd tonight. Um, if you guys want to raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> they are, yeah. All right, welcome. So they're doing a ride of taxa in Melbourne, Australia next month. And a few of us from the Farah U.S. team are heading over there, and we're going to ride in Australia to uh, to collaborate again yeah. towards towards the treatment and the cure. That's fantastic, fantastic. We got four minutes. Got time for one more question. One more good question. Anyone? Good question. Or one done? more good answer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, we love answers. All right. Well, thank you very much for everyone for coming. Okay, next we're going to have our scientific panel, Friedrich's Ataxia Therapeutic Approaches, um, headed by Jennifer Farmer, Executive Director of FARA. So while our, our next panel is getting mic'd and ready to go, um, I'm gonna just give a little bit um, of background for our next panel discussion. I'm Jen Farmer. Um, I'm actually the executive director of FARA, even though Ron likes to talk about my superpowers. Um, so um, I am uh, excited to be the moderator for our next panel, which is a discussion with our researchers, physicians, and some of our pharma executives. Before we start the panel, I just wanted to give a little bit of a review. Unfortunately, Dr. Z, oh, you guys can stay there. You're, you're OK. Um, fortunately, Dr. Z and Dr. Bidhi Chandani gave you a little bit of this um, in their talks. But this is what we call our treatment pipeline. And over here on the left are all the different ways in which we are trying to approach treatments for FA. And so down here, for example, you see gene and cell therapy, so getting at the actual um, genetic root cause of the disease, either by replacing the gene or figuring out ways to turn it back on. Um, for taxin, targeting the protein, can we replace it? Can we substitute it? And then downstream, when you have for taxin deficiency, there are changes in the cell, metabolic changes that occur. And so can we target those metabolic changes and reverse them? Or can we improve um, function inside a cell or improve the mitochondria itself? Oh, sorry. Um, so those are just, in broad strokes, the different types of approaches to treatments. And along the top part of the pipeline just shows you different stages of um, how research advance. And it starts here at discovery going all the way to when it's available to patients when it's in the pharmacy, for example, and your doctor can prescribe you a treatment. 
And so you can see we have lots of different treatment approaches. We believe this is really important because there isn't any disease that is fully treated with just one drug or one therapy. And so we know we need a diverse um, set of treatments to achieve our goal to cure FA. And you'll also notice that we're at different stages of development. And so the goals for our panel tonight are to dig into a few of these. We can't go over all of them. If we went into all of them, we'd be here past midnight. Um, but give you a sense of what some of these treatments are, how they work, where they are in development, and you know, what's the role of the patient engagement and the advocacy in advancing these programs. And so now my panel come up. So we're going to start off. I'm going to ask um, each of my panelists to introduce themselves. And when you introduce yourself, please tell us um, you know, which institution, company you are with, um, how long you've been working in Friedrich's Ataxia, and kind of how, how you or your company got to Friedrich's Ataxia. What was the catalyst that, that got you here? So um, Carol, I'll, I'll let you start. So I'm Carol ben Maimon. You can hear me? Because I can't hear myself. Okay. Um, I'm the CEO of Chondrial Therapeutics. Um, I'm a physician by background, but not a neurologist. Um, a nephrologist, actually a kidney doctor. I started working with a company called Deerfield, who are investors. I've been in the pharmaceutical industry for 25 years in a whole host of different diseases, orphan and, and others. And I was working for them doing due diligence, and in walked one day Dr. Payne, and Tom Hamilton, and they presented a re protein replacement strategy for Friedrich's ataxia. We did our research, we did due diligence, and Deerfield agreed to, um, to uh, invest $22.5 million in the technology, and I became CEO, and that was November 30th, 2016, and since then, I've been part of this community, I hope. Thank you, Carol. Hi, I'm Stephanie Cherky. Can you hear me? So uh, I am associate professor at the University of California, San Diego. San Diego. So I'm pretty new to uh, Friedrich Ataxia. I was the little blue thing and, you know, on the bottom. But, uh, but I have a lot of expertise in uh, stem cell and gene therapy. I was happy that I heard the word gene therapy because before everybody thought that gene therapy was science fiction, but now we realize how the, uh, the potential of this kind of treatment. And so, I have always believed in gene therapy to cure uh, genetic disorder. Um, so I have been in the field for many years and I work on another disorder called cystinosis. And it's also like Friedrich ataxia, a disease where um, the tissue degenerate progressively. And I wanted to, I did my PhD on that and I wanted to find a cure for this disease and using gene therapy. And I realized that it's not so simple when it's you know, so uh, systemic and touch so many organs. So I decided to, f to use a vehicle uh, to bring a, the gene to the, to the tissues. And, and so what's the best vehicle than our own stem cells that we all have in our body? I call them, I call them very intelligent cells. They know where to go and uh, when we have an injury. So I applied that to cystinosis and it worked really well in the mice. And now we are very close to file what we call an IND with a FDA to start a clinical trial. And we found the way this works, and because of the way this works, uh, we showed that the stem cell can deliver uh, organelles that we have, like mitochondria, in the disease cells. So I said, why not mitochondrial disease? And that's the first mitochondrial disease that came to my mind was Friedrich ataxia, because I, when I made the mouse model of cystinosis, during my PhD, the director of the core had her son who were affected, and so I heard about uh, her story a lot. So that's the first disease that came to my mind, and I'm so happy, you know, we tested this treatment, and we had so great results in the mouse model. So I just will use my, you know, exper expertise with uh, what I build with uh, cystinosis and apply it to, uh, to free cataxia, hopefully. Uh, my name is Hao Wang. I work for Takeda Pharmaceutical Company, and I've been with the company for almost two years. 
So how I uh, started the uh, FA research, uh, actually the first day when I joined the company, um, uh, so I, I, my functional area is in clinical development. And I, my general background is in neuroscience and neurodegenerative diseases, both in drug discovery and later I moved into the clinical development space. So the first day when I joined, they told me that I'll be working on uh, Friedrich ataxia for one of our compounds, which I can talk a little bit later, um, that we're exploring its uh, efficacy in Friedrich ataxia. And I knew uh, wrong from uh, other interactions when I was in uh, NIH. So, uh, so I immediately called wrong and, and said that I'll be working on Friedrich ataxia. I've heard a lot of good things about the uh, the FARA organization and, and how involved uh, you have been. So I, I was very excited to start day one to work on FA and it has been tremendously uh, rewarding for me and I, I'll be happy to share more about that. So if you guys looked at the agenda, you might have seen the name Edmund Doherty. Hopefully I don't look like an Ed, so <laughs> I'm subbing in for him tonight. My name is Kara Eichelkraut, and I'm the Senior Manager of Patient Advocacy at Riata Pharmaceuticals. I've been there for about four and a half years, which is also about the amount of time that we've been involved with FA research. And we have kind of an interesting story of how we got involved <laughs> with FA. So the last panel talked a bit about the basic research that FARA helps to, um, to move forward. And so a few years ago, there was some basic research done that found that this thing called NRF2 in the cells of patients who have FA is essentially turned down compared to people who don't have FA. And there happened to be a mother sitting in the audience when that research was presented. So she called Jen and she said, hey Jen, I heard this thing about NRF2. I know a company that has a drug that works on NRF2. Do you think that there could be some kind of connection there for Friedrich's ataxia? So Jen and Ron came down to Texas, they flew down to our office, and they said, hey guys, we have this research, you guys have a drug that works on NRF2, here are all the things that we can do to help establish a clinical trial and move it forward, let us know how we can make this happen for you, and here we are. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm sad that Ed's not here, but I'm kind of psyched we have another girl power panel. <laughs> so. Well, we just had a man power. So we I know, power. yeah. <laughs> so um, thank you all for introducing yourselves and getting, giving us a little bit of history and background. Um, maybe now we can kind of move to talk, talking about the treatments themselves that, that are being worked on. And so, um, Kara, maybe we'll start with you this time and maybe, you said NRF2, but can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So, and I realize Kara, <laughs> Kara's in patient advocacy. She is not a scientist. She's not of an MD or a PhD. So I'm, I'm sorry. I might Jen, have you just. You didn't have to tell people that. I was going to try to fake it. I'm sorry. All right. So I just made it even worse. So okay. Okay. Well, but, now there's full disclosure. <laughs> So when Jen displayed the, um, the pipeline of different treatment approaches earlier, one of the categories was mitochondrial dysfunction. And so this thing, NRF2 in the cells, when you turn it up, it helps to reduce stress inside of the cells. And when your cells are stressed, the mitochondria don't work as well. So if you activate that NRF2 and you turn it back up, essentially, the theory is that it will help to improve the mitochondrial function. And um, we've actually seen in certain... Um, preclinical studies that NRF2 activation helps to reduce or er, reduce the oxidative stress, improve the mitochondrial function, and also in, increase the number of mitochondria in the cells. Tell me if I have that right. A plus. Am I faking it well? A plus. Thank you. A plus. <laughs> I can't add anything to that. <laughs> so um, over the past four years, we you know, been working with Riata on this program. Um, what are some of the big accomplishments, you know, that have kind of taken place over the past year or so? Sure, so we have a clinical trial in FA. It's a two-part clinical trial, so kind of a phase two slash three weird hybrid. Um, last year, we presented data from the first part of that clinical trial, and that first part was to find the right dose of our drug called omavaloxone, or OMAV, or RTA-408, or many of the other names that people know it by. So we presented data on that, and we saw that there was an improvement in the neurological function measured by the modified FARS scale. Um, 
we got approval from the FDA to move into part two last year. And um, that part of the trial will have 100 patients and will be half drug, half placebo for one year. And once we have the data from that one year from a 100 patients, we can take that to the FTA potentially for approval for a therapy for FA. Thanks, Kara. And so modified FARS, Friedrich's ataxia rating scale, just um, one of the ways in which we use to kind of measure neurologic function and kind of help people do different daily tasks. Um, and um, so, Kara, kind of what you mentioned that um, the second trial has started and it's a year-long trial. So what kind of timeline are we looking at from where we are now and what other things are kind of happening? Mm -hmm. So the trial is currently enrolling 100 patients. We're still looking for volunteers right now. Once we have all 100 volunteers, then we will need to collect one year of data on all 100 of those people. Then there's a period of time that it takes to analyze the data, package it all together, and then submit it to the FDA. That answers your question. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> all right, I'm going to move on and um, ask how to kind of give us um, an overview of the, the drug that Takeda is working on and, and that therapeutic approach. So the drug that we're currently working on, the name of the drug is called TEC831. Um, the, the, this is a small molecule. It's supposed to inhibit an enzyme that's called the D-amino acid oxidase. And this enzyme is highly enriched in the cerebellum. Um, and uh, as you know, that cerebellum plays an important role in the ataxia. Um, the preclinical research uh, that has done in our company, uh, before I joined, actually have shown that the, um, by giving the, this uh, inhibitor to the animals uh, models, in the animal model, it does indeed increase uh, amino acid called d uh which uh, can act on the, the neuronal circuitry in the cerebellum. And the hypothesis is that it may potentially regulate the cerebellum output and therefore optimizes and it may uh, improve ataxia. In the animal models, it, it did uh, show that it improves uh, beam walk in the animal model to help the animal walk better. Uh, but you know, for it, we, we need to test that in, the, in humans, in, the, in our patients, to see if it indeed has efficacy. And that's what we have been doing uh, started uh, last year, end of last year and over this year and uh, in, in our, our trial. And I, I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, many of the patients uh, here or, or not here uh, have been participating in the trial. We're tremendously grateful for your participation. Uh, I know it's a lot of effort. Many of you have to fly and, uh, or drive long distance to come to the clinical sites. It's a lot of effort. I also want to express our gratitude to the uh, the investigators uh, and study coordinators, all, all who are involved in the, in the trial, uh, you've done a tremendously uh, great job in uh, having the trial executed. I want to thank uh, Farah and Jen in particular uh, in a very timely and e effective communications to the patients and the community so that we actually um, are ahead of the schedule to, to get our trial uh, done. Oh, thank you. Um, I think the the trial started about a little less than a year ago, right? Yes, November. Dr. Z's site randomized the first patient for us. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you're getting close to um, finishing the enrollment for this trial, and this trial um, is a three month trial. So the study that Kara mentioned has to take place over a year. Um, at different stages of development, drugs get tried for different periods of time. So the further along in development you go, the longer we need to do the trials, both for safety and also to show durability of, of the efficacy. Um, and so the trial that um, Takeda is running now is called a phase two trial. And this yes. is the first time this particular drug's been in people with FA. Um, and so it's a three month trial, um, correct? Right, the treatment duration is three months. So what do you see sort of as the, the timeline from, from where we are now and kind of going forward? 
Yeah, so I think this trial is uh, critical. It's the initial trial, as Jen mentioned, uh, but it's critical for us to see if there's uh, efficacy and that will help us to make a decision to uh, take this forward uh, or not uh, to a pivotal trial. And uh, if the result is positive, certainly we'll be uh, initiating a phase three trial uh, after you know, we need to analyze the data, um, uh, making a decision and, and uh, taking the right dose to the, to the pivotal trial. And, and that pivotal trial, the treatment duration will be longer that will be also followed up by an open label uh, safety extension that could be uh, one year as well. So there will be a lot to do, uh, but it all depends on the, the result. I mean, will be, the decisions will be made uh, based on the data. So I, I have a question that wasn't part of our initial script, but I can't help but ask it of, of both Hal and, and Kara, if either one of you are comfortable answering this question, but it came up because in our first panel, um, we had two um, teenage girls um, participate, and I think it was Annie who mentioned that um, she's not always eligible for clinical trials. And so the clinical trials that are ongoing right now are primarily in adults or older teens. Um, what's the process for moving towards um, pediatric trials, and is that something you're looking to do? Yeah, I'm comfortable speaking about that. Um, so it's it's part of the the planning for the uh, phase three development plan, as well as uh, looking into applications for pediatric patients. We've been working with FAR actually closely, um, and we are we have already developed a pediatric uh, development plan. Uh, where we'll be uh, moving down to the uh, early ages uh, as soon as uh, possible uh, once we have uh, an early rate of the, the signal. So basically, uh, if, we, if it's positive uh, in phase two, uh, there's no reason not to, uh, to start the uh, pediatric uh, planning um, as long as the safety and efficacy uh, suggest that that is indicated. Thank you. <laughs> so um, we're going to kind of kind of switch gears where um, where both Takeda and Riata are in clinical trials. Um, the next two programs that Stephanie and Carol are going to talk to you about are not yet to the clinic, but working towards there. And so you'll kind of get to see now what's happening at at some of the earlier stages of development. And so um, maybe I'm going to ask Carol to go next. Can okay. <laughs> so. Um, Mike is working? Yep. So um, we're actually working on a protein replacement therapy. So as we've been talking about throughout the evening, FA for a toxin is missing in patients with FA or sort of significantly decreased. So our technology is actually targeted to replace for taxin in the mitochondria. And we do that by giving an injection under the skin like insulin, like you give insulin. Um, it'll probably be daily. Um, I don't know that for sure yet. Um, but it, when you give it subcutaneously in mice, it does affect in the knockout mice and in the models, it does positively affect the disease state. And so we're working now to develop the manufacturing. Um, what happens is the frataxin is attached to a carrier protein and that carrier protein takes it across the cell membrane into the mitochondria where there's a naturally occurring enzyme that cleaves off that carrier protein and leaves the frataxin molecule in the mitochondria. Now this is all basic science and it's never been studied in human beings. In order to study in human beings, we have to file what's called an IND, an Investigational New Drug Application. In order to file an IND, we have to be able to make this product. And because it's a protein, it's actually quite complicated to make it. And so we've been working for the last two years in developing the manufacturing, um, making sure we can make it not only safely but reproducibly so that we have enough for clinical trials. We've pretty much accomplished that at this point and we're now going into our toxicology studies to test it in animals to support the filing of the IND. We anticipate that the IND will be filed sometime next year and we'll be starting clinical trials whereas these guys are in phase two and phase three. Um, we're actually in phase one. When we, once we file, we're preclinical now, but once we file, it'll be phase one. 
this drug has never been given to human beings before, so there's actually a very calculated way of starting to make sure that you start at very, very low doses in humans. And the initial trials will be in patients, but they will be at very, very low doses, which will then be escalated over time to make sure that we don't harm anybody. So the trials are very labor intensive. We're working very closely with Farah. We'll probably talk about that a little more as we start to design these trials. And again, we appreciate very much how challenging this is for, for patients to participate, but it's, it's really necessary in order, order to get the FDA to let us move forward. Um, to your pediatric question, we also are looking very aggressively at, at patients. The FDA does not allow you to go into, into children unless you have safety in adults for most diseases. Some of them they do, but for this disease they won't. So as soon as we have our safety data in adults, we actually will be going into, into children um, and establishing safety so that children will be eligible for um, some of our trials later on. They may be separate studies, but they will be eligible, we hope, for trials later on. So Carol, in two years, um, this program went from an academic science lab where um, you know, Dr. Payne had, had showed a proof of concept in the animals, but, you know, you, you talked about, you know, really then thinking, you know, we've got to take this and, and make it really into a drug. And, and the manufacturing piece um, has been huge. And, you know, this is, a, I, I, this is something I certainly didn't really appreciate, but, you know, this is the first time you're making this, and it's, it's a biologic, so it grows in, like, E. coli, and you have to grow, like, lots and lots and lots of so, this stuff, so right? So biologics are not small molecules. There are two kinds of drugs. There are small molecules and they're biologics. The small molecules are synthetic compounds, and those, that's usually what you get in a pill, right? Biologics are actual proteins that have, and what, what they do, it's very complicated, it's actually very interesting. They actually insert the DNA into either bacteria or mammalian cells, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And they grow the bacteria, and then they lyse the bacteria, and then you have to purify the molecule that the bacteria has, has, has produced. It's a very complicated process. Um, and it, ta it literally takes days to make these proteins, and then you have to formulate it. So it's, it's challenging, it's been um, very interesting. We do it at contract manufacturers who do this all the time and have multiple products so they know what we're doing. We're, we're, we're 10 people, <laughs> we're really small, <laughs> we don't have our own plant. Um, but it is very complicated and we've been, it's taken us a couple of years. We've also reproduced Dr. Payne's data and we've also been setting up all the analytical methods and all the other requirements that FDA has in order to file the IND and be able to start our phase one studies. Um, and it's not quite two years. It's, it's, I know. <laughs> it's 21 months. <laughs> no, they've been, they've been working really hard. <laughs> And it's very frustrating because we wanted as much as you do, guys do to get it there as quickly as we possibly can. Just um, one question just for clarity, I think. Um, so you mentioned that this is, this is a frataxin replacement. Um, and so unlike gene therapy that I think, um, you know, part of the, the practice behind that is um, once you replace the gene, it's there, right? And so with a protein replacement, um, you mentioned this is going to be an injection once a day, and so proteins turn over in the cell, and so that's part of, um, I think, you know, the, the uniqueness and the challenges and the opportunity is that you can you so keep giving this. So the opportunity is that you can, you can also titrate it. So if somebody, for whatever reason, was getting too much, you can stop or you can titrate it. It's also a systemic therapy. So by giving it subcutaneously, we, w we have to prove this. We have proved it in mice, we haven't proved it in people, that it goes to all the different organs in the body that need it. Um, and you just have to give enough to make sure that that happens. So it has its pros, it has its cons, but I think your point was a very important one, which is there's probably not one size fits all here. And all of these different therapies as you go through development are gonna have goods and bads, these are drugs. They have adverse effects, they have, that's the way the world works. So 
managing these patients will become an art. And there's many diseases. I always go back to multiple sclerosis. In the 90s, there was nothing for those patients. And today, there's probably a dozen different drugs out there that the doctors have learned to manage and to titrate. And so I hope that in the next three to five years, as Ron talked about, we don't have one therapy. We have multiple therapies. Um, the work that you've done in cystinosis and that this is sort of a combined gene therapy and cell therapy, but it's, it's pretty elegant and complicated. <laughs> so <It's> complicated too. <laughs> talk um, us through that. Yeah, so the, the, gene ther the, the idea behind a gene therapy is would be a one-time treatment. So it would be systemic and one-time treatment. As I said before, um, you know, gene therapy is using usually a vector that would bring a, a new gene to, uh, to the old cells. Um, by using our own stem cells, we bypass the fact that it's hard to deliver a gene to all tissues. Uh, so the way we do it is that we use uh, what we call hematopoietic stem cells, which is a complicated name. It's actually stem cells that we all have in our bone marrow. And these cells uh, give, uh, give rise to our blood cells. All the cells in our blood come from the stem cells. Um, I have to say that I didn't believe that these cells would do anything to cystinosis, and I tried you know, the other kind of stem cells we found in the bone marrow, and we were very surprised that we found that these blood cells could treat the disease uh, for the life of, lifetime of a, of a mice. So what we do is that after, we take these uh, stem cells from their bone marrow um, in, in a patient who would take uh, you know, from the blood, and we put them in a petri dish, and after we gene correct the cells, the gene, into the, these stem cells. So in the, the case of frataxin, it would be the, fr the frataxin gene that would gene correct in the stem cells. Then after, we have to make space into the bone marrow of the patient, so it's kind of a, a short chemotherapy. Uh, for like a two or three days to remove the patient uh, stem cell that left. So like that after we re-infuse the stem cells that are this time gene corrected and they will replace uh, the, the cells in the bone marrow and they will be stay there for the lifetime of a patient or you know, the, an individual. This is this this is not science fiction. It happens every day, uh, you know. For if you have you know cancer or something, they do a bone marrow. This is bone marrow transplant, yeah. basically. The only thing that we do is that we gene correct them. But the, the technique is happening every day in every uh, hospital. So it's a bone marrow transplant, basically. Um, and once the stem cells are in the bone marrow, they stay there. They replicate there. They multiply there. But the beauty of these cells, and that's why I think, you know, I call them intelligent cells, is that they, if there is anything wrong in your body, mine, yours, or any patient body, they will go, there is a stimuli, and they will go to this, the site of injury to fix the injury. This is what they are made for, too, you know. So this, that's the idea behind the first time I, tr I uh, tried that for cystinosis. I was like, okay, there is injury everywhere in their, all their tissues, so why the stem cell we don't try and bring the gene there? Uh, and it's exactly what happened. Uh, we can follow the cells with uh, you know, um, fluorescent markers, so they are green, red, whatever, and we can see these cells steadily engrafted into the tissue of injury, of the site of injury. And we know now how they, they function. We, they know, we know now that what they do is that they make this long tubular protrusion, the long tubes, and try to deliver what is missing into the other disease cells. And this is what happened in, in cystinosis, but we have shown the same thing in Friedrich ataxia. Because we have done the proof of concept, so we are early in the process, but we have done the proof of concept in the mice using not gene-modified cells, but the wild-type cells from um, um, another mice. And we could completely rescue the locomotor function of the mice um, for you know, a long time, and uh, we prevented the uh, neuronal degeneration uh, of, uh, of the mice. Um, so the mice is not a, a human, so we are still you know, a long way. Um, but I mean, these proof of concept are very uh, strong and promising. Um, and so, as I said, we in gene therapy, you know, it's it's um, because it's a one-time therapy. It's not like a drug; we cannot remove it when it's done. Uh, the FDA require a lot of uh, toxicology studies, and 
Um, and so it's a long process, but what we've learned with cystinosis, I mean, uh, will help us to gain time a lot to go to an IND and, and, and a clinical trial. The good thing, though, in gene therapy is that it's a phase one, two, directly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the only part we gain, but it's, it's still, you know, it's, uh, so uh, we, it's, it's safety but efficacy also. And what we also try to unroll, I mean, for cystinosis, it's a staggered design. And for the phase one, two, we will try to unroll children on the, la on the third cohort. So, you know, because, you know, so there are ways to uh, unroll younger or uh, adolescents, at least, in the, this kind of chain uh, of uh, so Stephanie, you, you mentioned that um, some of the early mouse studies that you did, you um, gave the mice sort of healthy mouse stem cells, uh, FA mice, right? So these were yeah. mice with Friedrich's taxi. You gave them healthy stem cells from another mouse yeah. and, and got that proof of concept. But um, what are you now needing to test in the mice for like the next stage of developing this in FA? So what's currently going on in the lab? So, so now we are uh, developing the way to gene correct uh, the, the, the cells, which we have now. Um, so we are moving forward now to uh, uh, do this uh, gene correction uh, in mouse cells to show that it's still working, but also in human cells. So we are moving to human cells. We are in healthy uh, cells, but I was telling Ryan, you know, just a year, but I will need this blood very soon because we are <laughs> going to, you know, this is a good news. We are going I know to somebody who might be able to draw that. <laughs> <laughs> the vampire. Yeah, because we, you know, all the, all the protocol needs to be, um, uh, because the, the disease cells might be different. So we have, even if we have a good protocol in a healthy cell, we have to make sure that they work on, on uh, this is part of the manufacturing that we are talking about. So we are going to move very soon to patient cells and see if our approach is working in uh, patient cells to gene correct the cells. If this works, I think that will be um, a key, uh, and we will uh, go to the FDA for a pre-IND and move forward to the top study. Great. Well, thank you. So we, we only have a few minutes left, so I have one more question for my panel. Um, and that is, um, if you could share with us um, you know, how you've worked with the patient community um, or FARA and kind of what, what that role has been and what are the contributions being made. I think, you know, how and um, Kara both talked about the importance of folks um, enrolling and volunteering for clinical studies. Um, and are there maybe other ways too in which um, patient engagement has really helped inform your, your programs? Sure, now you can go, or Kara. <laughs> um, I'm actually very excited to talk about this topic because <laughs> uh, it's, um, you know, I started talking about uh, getting to, uh, started my, my job on FA and talked to Ron, get very excited. And uh, I have to say that I was even more uh, impressed uh, after I had a chance to work with Jen and many of the, uh, Kyle and, and um, Takeda is very patient-centric, and we are actually uh, asked to uh, engage the patients as much as possible. And so I had an idea to invite a few patients to come to Takeda and uh, as a patient panel to educate our broader community about FA. The answer was absolutely, we're coming, and we're coming whenever you want us to come. <laughs> And, uh, and Kyle, Jan, uh, a few others, uh, and three uh, other ambassadors came, um, and we had a, uh, a panel discussion with our employees who are scientists, physicians, or, or maybe just administrative assistants. And uh, the response was so positive. Uh, the panelists did a great job. They uh, educated us about how uh, they were diagnosed, their journey, and how the uh, treat, what kind of treatment they, they need. Um, and they had a great sense of humor and, you know, despite all the difficulties they are experiencing. Um, and, uh, you know, the feedback I got from my friends uh, and colleagues were that made their day. So one physician came to me after the, the, the panel and said, you know, this really made my day uh, because, you know, I got discouraged uh, doing research, get negative results day after day, uh, but uh, you know, this day uh, taught me why we're doing this uh, difficult job, 
And uh, that also made my day of uh, hearing uh, how that my colleagues got inspired and continue to do uh, the job that we need to do to uh, not only working on FA, we're also working on uh, many neurodegenerative diseases and uh, psychiatric diseases in Takeda, but that was just uh, one highlight um, uh, for me. Um, well, there, in, in terms of uh, the far other group, um, I don't think I don't know if, uh, what the audience think. Um, I personally think they are a uh, exemplary, exemplary uh, advocacy group. Um, you know, I knew good reputations before I started, uh, but this really confirms. Uh, the, they are also very smart in identifying what they need to be focusing on. So they rally around the patients, uh, connect the, the scientific, uh, the industry, uh, the medical community, uh, and they identify the critical issues that need to be uh, dealt with, uh, uh, such as you know how to enable uh, future the clinical trials, not only symptomatic, and how do you uh, design trials for uh, disease progression prevention, uh, and so the natural history study is a great uh, example of that. The biomarker research that we'll be focusing tomorrow will be. Uh, another very smart uh, area of research. Um, I, I think I have high confidence that with this community of uh, very collaborative approach, they're not only saying that. Uh, <laughs> I hope you, don't, you, you also uh, believe that they're, they're doing it and they're an example for all the patient advocacy group. Thank so you. Um, as far as the, uh, their actual involvement in helping us design the clinical studies, um, I can also uh, speak a lot, but I will just leave it uh, to say that you know they're involved in the study design uh, to give input from patient's perspective about what's feasible, what's reasonable burden uh, to the patients so that we, I know we want to get data, 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 right? <laughs> um, but we also uh, want to consider uh, your burden in particip uh, participation of the trial. And we uh, try to hit a, a good balance there uh, so they are involved in providing input about the, you know, the, the kind of bottles we provide to you for the trial, the, the size of the pill, so that it, we make it a little easier uh, for uh, the trial participant to, to actually participate. So um, I can say many more, but uh, I'll give some other panelists some time. <laughs> There are obviously a lot of things that Farah does to help all of us up here and help to further research in the FA community. I mean, how outlined a ton of ways, and <laughs> you guys do so much for all of us. Um, the patient community is incredible. Uh, the advocacy group is the gold standard of what an advocacy group should be. Um, I think the only thing that I'd like to add on is to say that anything and everything that everybody in this room does to contribute towards FA research makes a difference. If it's participating in a clinical trial, of course, that's great. And if you can't do that, there's still more things you can do. Giving a cheap swab or you know, um, a vial of blood, whether you're a patient or a sibling or a friend, or I mean, Jen has taken my blood before. <laughs> there are things that you guys can do. <laughs> Whose blood has she not taken? Can anybody raise their hand? I mean. <laughs> but, uh, you guys can make a difference, and you guys have made a difference. It's because of all of you guys in this room and in this community who are watching, everybody who's part of this FA family, you guys are all the reason why that pipeline is so massive. So keep on doing what you're doing and know that everything you do makes a difference. Thanks, Kara. Yeah, so uh, I mean, uh, advocacy group are uh, 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 key in the development of any therapy. Um, I worked a lot with the Cystinosis Foundation. I'm uh, very close to them and, and the patient. And um, I, when I started this project at funding, and I remember when they uh, received an email from Jen saying, "Oh, we we heard, you know, we saw your paper. You know, can we have a call? You know, can we call you?" And so I said, "Okay, yeah." And I was just getting a news that I didn't get the NIH grant. That, you know, I was really counting on to continue this research because I, the funding was no more, no longer there. And and she said, "Do you need money?" I said, "This is a you know really timing <laughs> because I have I, you know I need to reapply to the NIH grant, but 
right now I have no more funding, so the, the, the project would have stopped. So I, uh, I, I wrote a grant, you know, in like a few weeks I got the funding, the, continue, the, the, the work didn't stop, I didn't have to, you know, I could keep my staff working on, on this project. So it is really, really helpful and it was a one year grant. I got the news to this week that I got an NIH, NIH grant for continue this project, so it is, it's a great news. But, but the, the kind of, of funding that the, this kind of treatment uh, or this kind of research require cannot be completely funded by NIH. This is not, it's, you know, for, for fundamental research, yes, but not for a research that goes to clinic. Um, so advocacy groups are always there. Uh, to help find funding. It's a really a collective effort to be there for samples, you know, for, uh, for uh, advising us. I mean, I got Jen on the phone and, and, you know, people from your group many times to advise me on the best mouse model, the best uh, uh, cell line, because as I said, I, I'm, you know, still pretty new to the field. And so um, I met, you know, amazing people from the community and uh, when Kyle and Vlad came, you know, and spent several hours with my group. And uh, I mean, all my group was so like, full of energy and wanted to find the cure. And so it's really important also that we share and we learn from each other. So um, I'm so happy to be part of this community now. Thank you. Thank you. Carol, yeah? So, um, I second everything everybody said, but I'll add a few things. Um, we actually have a lab um, where we do basic science work on FA and on Frataxin. Um, there's a whole host of things that are required by FDA, not the least of which is called a potency assay, which is incredibly challenging. Um, and we use a lot of the samples um, that we get from Farron from the patients who have contributed. So I think not only participating in the clinical trials, but I want to thank all of you who give blood, who give tissue, the skin punches that we heard about earlier today. They are painful, but they are much, much appreciated, and they're really valued and treasured, and they don't get wasted. Those tissues, we understand that they, they come with, with a meaning, and they come from patients. And so we've been using a lot of that to help us further our research and to further our development activities. The other thing that's a little bit different, I think, also about FARA is the, what Ron said, which is collaboration. It's very important when you put groups like us together. You have somebody who's really, really early in, in breaking edge technology and, and science. Somebody, company who we're really early, I told you we're all of 12 people and we'll be out looking for additional funding because that $22.5 million doesn't take us where we need to go to get a cure. Um, you've got people who are further along and making us collaborate um, is, is also is often not easy. <laughs> um, and I think Farah does a really good job of making sure that companies don't stay isolated and the research doesn't just remain in somebody's lab under a confidentiality agreement. It actually gets shared. And then the third thing that I don't think has been mentioned, um, when you talked about breaking down barriers, I don't remember whether it was Pat or Ron who spoke about it. Um, Farah has been very, very effective at educating FDA. And that is not an easy task. I've been doing this for 25 years. But the more FDA understands the medical need, the more FDA understands what the patients are going through, what are the clinically relevant endpoints, um, what are the challenges in designing the clinical trials? Those things are things that industry can do, but it comes, it's much, much more effective when done by, a, um, by a, a patient association. And I'm sure many of you were there, but for those of you who weren't, uh, June a year ago, um, there was a patient-directed advocacy group. Patient-focused drug development <laughs> meeting. <laughs> Um, and it was incredibly efficient. There were or people from Orphan Drug, there were people from the neurological divisions, there were uh, probably at least 20 people from FDA, tons of patients, and it was very effective at, at sort of making it easier for us when we walk into FDA to talk about the technology we have and not spend time educating them on the disease, because we only get an hour, if we get an hour. So the, the work that Farah has done with FDA is another barrier, I think, that's been um, broken down and been very, very helpful for all of us sitting up here.
Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you to my panelists this evening. Um, you are all terrific, Should and I. Roll I up my sleeve? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow. Um, no, I really appreciate you all traveling here, being here this evening, and sharing with us um, all the exciting progress that you're making in each of your programs. And I hope that all of you um, really take away an, un an appreciation for kind of the, the breadth and the depth of the research and the progress that we're trying to make towards treatments and a cure. So thank you. OK. Well, so it's been a great symposium so far. By the way, I'm Clifton Gooch, Chair of Neurology at USF. Uh, and uh, we have been at this now for 10 years. Uh, Hurricane Irma did succeed in giving us a little pause in the symposium last year, but not the gala. And when, when it came and we had the storm, I, I, I told Dr. Z, uh, I'm not going to do the full name, of course, because it's challenging. I told Dr. Z, you know, I'm worried about the gala, you know, because uh, Hurricane Irma came and fortunately it, we had a near miss, but everybody's hearing how terrible the storm is and you know uh, how many people are going to come to the gala is it going to be successful and lo and behold just literally days after this monster storm came through everybody descends upon tampa and the gala is a, a fabulous success i think the most successful ever uh so really phenomenal and that says a lot about the dedication of the people in this room which we'll come back to in a minute but uh, in this symposium, too, I think this may be uh, record attendance. It seems to grow every year. We have standing room only. We have a satellite uh, room in the back. Um, but I want to give you guys a, a little wrap up here, and I want to give you um, uh, an overview of, of what all this means. Try to put it into context. We have people here who are scientists, people from industry. We have families, patients. We have uh, some people who are donors and interested in supporting the cause. So let me just tell you a little bit about how this works. You know, my focus of my career has really been on, on trying to develop new therapies for neurological disease. What brought me into neurology in the first place was that I saw when I was a medical student uh, that we were on the cusp of some real advances in these terrible diseases in neurology that we deal with because of advances in basic neuroscience, which were happening in the 70s and 80s. So I must tell you about uh, Friedreich's ataxia. Uh, when I was in medical school, which is the 1980s, you know, as so my 15-year-old daughter would say, oh, dad, you're so old. <laughs> but the 1980s have not been that long ago. Um, we could do nothing for Friedreich's ataxia. So they showed us a slide, they showed us here's the problem, here's the problem, here's where the nervous system is damaged, you know, question, what causes it? We have no idea. No idea at all. You know, we knew it's inherited, we don't know what causes it. Advances in genetics came, and as you've heard, in the 1990s, the gene was discovered, mid-1990s. Um, so the, so discovering the gene is the first step in a long discovery process and figuring out what happens with the disease and what causes it, because, you know, genes do things, so discovering that a patient has a gene is good, but then you have to figure out what that gene does and how it actually causes the disease in question. So in this case, they discovered the disease and usually it takes years to do that. Sometimes it takes decades to do that. There are genes that we discovered decades ago that we still don't know exactly how they cause the disease process. But here in Friedreich's ataxia, that discovery was accelerated and really within just a few short years, we knew what this gene did. And not only did we know what the gene did, but we knew what this protein did and, and the discovery of the protein, by the way, came about because of looking into Friedreich's ataxia in the gene. And then we started saying, okay, now, the, the bottom line, the goal, what we're really after here uh, is a treatment. How can we cure this disease? So just to give you perspective in other neurological diseases, typically the timeline from doing, moving from a basic science laboratory discovery to the beginning of a first drug in, in humans, we call this rational drug design, uh, takes 25 years. 25 years to move from a laboratory basic discovery to initial trials in humans, sometimes longer. Now I want to take you back to the FA story. So we discovered the gene in the mid-1990s. We discovered the gene product for taxin a couple, just a couple of years after that. And then by early to mid-2000s, really within a decade or less, we are already beginning to launch clinical trials in Friedreich's ataxia. So that timeline was cut in half or a third already. 
Um, this is incredible progress. Of course, we'd all like it to happen today, you know, uh, but, but when you compare this to other disease processes, it's really an amazingly accelerated pace of progress. And now, where are we? 20 years after the founding of the organization, we have over a dozen clinical trials. We have clinical trials that are, that are focused on getting at the very heart of the disease where it lives in the genes themselves using techniques of genetic engineering and modulation. And we're, we're still looking at other therapies to support the mitochondria and do everything else. That's an amazing level of progress. So, you know, how did that progress happen? Well, again, as I've said before here, it's not an accident. And there were many keys to this progress. And frankly, it takes a small army to make this kind of progress on a disease like this in such a short period of time. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about FARA. You've heard a lot about FARA in the last panel. I deal with all kinds of patient organizations in neurology across all kinds of disease processes. And uh, they're all good organizations in their own way, but I must tell you that the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance is one of the, I think the, actually, in my, in my experience, the single most effective organization uh, in managing disease and managing searches and, and progress towards a cure. And, and why is that? Well, again, early in my career, I was under the naive assumption that when you had a disease, that there would be some master planner who would help to coordinate research worldwide. They would be someone who was actually looking all, at all the pieces across the board internationally, helping to make sure that everybody was pulling in the same direction, moving towards the cure uh, all together to trying, to trying to make progress with a master plan in mind. Well, guess what? That virtually never happens in science. It is extraordinarily rare for that to happen. Um, and I, some organiza organizations try to do this, but there are challenges to this kind of process. So this organization, FARA, is almost unique in its, the success that it's had. And a lot of it gets back to its founder, uh, Ron Bartek. And uh, he actually started in government. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ron. Uh, you, you, some of you may know he used to work for the CIA, so don't cross him. <laughs> he still has contacts. But, uh, but actually... Um, his, uh, his experience in government, he quickly turned with great passion, uh, and as you can see, he's a passionate man, to the cause of Friedreich's ataxia. And he began to delve into the processes within government and also applied his strategic organization to building this, this Friedreich's ataxia research alliance with the sole purpose of accelerating the search for the cure by being this master planner that looked across the board and, and was able to arrange the pieces and make everybody move quickly in the same direction. Uh, very rare. Jen Farmer joined uh, shortly after that. He's been a fabulous executive director in, in helping to add her strategic expertise and, and moving things forward. And then uh, added to the mix after that were a number of very important donors, and particularly the Avery family, uh, Paul and Suzanne Avery, who, uh, who then put their uh, considerable strategic expertise in business and in finance and in, in donor support behind the organization as well. So then you had the A-team all together. Uh, you, had, uh, you had the business mind, you had the strategic mind, you had the, the person focusing on government regulations. And I just want to tell you something about an experience that I had with Ron outside of FA, but related. So, uh, you know, I've done, as, I, as I've just told you, a lot of work in trying to, you know, come up with accelerating drugs in neurology uh, for various diseases. I've served on the FDA's approval panel for neurological drugs. Um, and because of that, uh, when Congress was looking at, at trying to streamline the FDA process, which uh, has, is sometimes clunky, as some of you may, may know, it might surprise you to hear that the government doesn't always work as efficiently as it might, but, uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, uh, this was a problem, this was a barrier to accelerating uh, the search for the cure. Uh, so uh, they came to, to me and said, you know, would you give us your opinion about uh, this particular thing we're trying to do called the Cures Act to accelerate and streamline FDA processing speed drugs to market for patients with bad diseases. I said, yeah, that's great. That's exactly what I've always wanted you to do. So let me give you my thoughts. Um, and uh, so I, I started asking people and I went to Ron and I said, Ron, I said, you know, um, I'm working on this. What are your ideas? We had a very great conversation and I must say that he did a lot of my homework and so I was asked to prepare a little white paper for Congress, which I did. Uh, and actually, it, Ron's ideas are, are most of it. Uh, it's, it's really a great strategic blueprint. And, uh, and it was taken very seriously. Uh, it was part of, now part of the congressional record. And it's helped to pass the Cures Act, uh, which is now in place and is accelerating drugs to market. So Ron had this knowledge because he's immersed himself in, in this regulatory environment. And he has the sole mission of trying to break down and fare along with him all of the barriers to speeding these treatments 
uh, to patients. That's, that's you guys. And that's just invaluable. And, and you know, pay, all patient organizations do advocacy, but FAIR does it particularly well and particularly single-mindedly. Uh, they supported the Cures Act, the Organization of Rare Diseases. Ron was helped, uh, helped really instrumental in helping to found that which has broken down all kinds of regulatory barriers to research and drug access and everything else for FA and other diseases. So, uh, so you have to have an organization like that. And you're very fortunate in, in free drug cytaxia world to have FARA. It's a fabulous organization. What else do you have to have? Well, obviously, you have to have the researchers and the physicians who do the boots on the ground science. You've heard from many of them today who are doing the hard scientific work to actually come up with the cure in the laboratory, uh, in the clinic. You have to have medical schools and institutes behind them with their support uh, who are also cheering them on and giving them what they need to be able to make progress towards a cure. Um, they're a, a, an essential piece of the puzzle. You have to have pharma. You've heard from the, our pharmaceutical representatives. Pharma actually is an essential partner because uh, the, in the United States and really worldwide, since the U.S. is the leader in the production of new drugs, uh, pharma pays for most of the clinical research once you have laboratory discoveries that actually test these drugs in humans. Eighty percent of it is paid for by pharma. So it's very difficult to get that piece of the equation, the essential piece of the equation, to prove the drug works in actual people once it's proven in mice and in the laboratory. So our pharma partners, absolutely essential. And FARA has done a fabulous job of wrangling our financial partners together uh, with uh, pharmaceutical partners, with our uh, centers such as at USF, the ATAXI Center, with our medical schools and others, to all work together in a cooperative manner to accelerate the search for the cure. <clears throat> so those are all very important, but we also have to have support. Well, where does that come from? Well, some of the scientific support comes from federal grants, such as from the NIH, but as you just heard, sometimes NIH funding is not necessarily directed at the questions that are important for free drug cytaxia research. So you need other sources of support. With, the, with FARA, those sources come from the donors and supporters of FARA, of which many of you are in the room. Uh, FARA has many great friends across the country, uh, captains of industry, very wealthy people who have become interested in this cause, uh, thanks to uh, Paul and Suzanne and many of the others that you've heard from this evening. Um, and they really provide the fuel that sort of lights the engines of, of the, the rocket that's going to take us to the cure. Very, very important. But now we really come to uh, one of the most important parts of our equation, really the most important part, and that's you guys right here, patients and their families. Because, you know, why do, why do we do this as researchers? You know, what, what drives us? And what drives our pharmaceutical partners? What drives FARA? Why are we interested in doing this? It's for you. We want to see these diseases conquered. We want to see free drugs particularly conquered. We want to fix you. We want to help you. And, uh, and the people you've heard from tonight are dedicating their careers and their lives to helping find a cure and treatments for your disease. And we are making fabulous progress. So as I said, over a dozen clinical trials in 20 years, it's unprecedented. Each of these trials, if each one of those trials is a little bit successful, when we put them together, they might be much more successful. So there's great reason for hope, and these are trials that are ongoing right now. So I also want to just take a step back for a moment and, and ask those of you who don't have free drugs ataxia, you know, what would you do if you did? So families who live close to this, uh, they understand this. Those of you who support the patients, you have felt this yourself. But think about it for a second. What do you do when life throws you a curveball, a potentially crushing challenge? What do you do? Do you lay down and give up? Do you just bemoan your fate and say, there's nothing I could do about it? Well, sometimes that happens, but you should not do that. What you should do is you should fight. You should fight. And what we have here, sitting right here, and those of you who are on the web right now watching this streaming broadcast, we have fighters. They're fighters right here. That's why they're here. They're fighting. They pick up their sword. They say, I'm going to fight this. I'm going to fight this with everything that I have. And their family members are fighting beside them. And beside them, the donors and supporters, friends of the family, are also fighting. The researchers, the pharma partners, we are all fighting this battle. So that's the kind of passion you're going to have to need. We've seen examples of that tonight on our patient panel. We've seen fighters. What are the, so did they lay down and say, I give up, that's it? No, not at all. What did we hear? I'm the first person in my family to get a master's. I had twins and went to Disney World, right? 
I'm president of my class. Okay? These are not, these are not people who are giving up. These are fighters. And then we heard something that Sam said. I don't know if you caught it. It went by pretty quickly. Um, why are you interested in clinical trials? So, where is Sam? There you are, right there. And what did she say? She said, because I wanted to help myself, but I also wanted to help everybody else. So, now we get to the point where we think a little bit about the meaning of life and, and why any of us do anything that we do. What's important, really? Well, we can get very confused in the modern era about what's really important. Uh, we can think about fame and fortune, accumulation of wealth, um, achievements, uh, honors, whatever it may be. But, you know, um, what's really important is the good that we do for those around us every day and also the imprint that we leave going forward as those that come after us will either benefit or not benefit from the lives that we have led and what we have done in our, in our worlds and in our work. That's what's really very important. So now, those of you who are here have a, a great opportunity because here we are at what I would call a historic juncture in this disease. We have seen such phenomenal progress. We are at a place, I think, in the coming few years where I, I believe we will really begin to see some treatments that are going to have some actual benefits for the patients. Uh, and I think that ultimately, these threads are going to lead us to treatments that will either forestall the disease entirely, and eventually, I think genetic engineering will enable us to cure and eliminate free drugs ataxia. So what does it mean then when you support free drugs ataxia research? You're supporting the patients, you're supporting the families, but what are you also doing? Here is a chance for you, by supporting this cause of the search for the cure in FA, to potentially eliminate a disease from the face of humanity forever. Because once we find a genetic therapy that treats this disease, we will have the tools to prevent it in those that have the aberrant gene, to repair the gene, to fix it, so they never develop the disease. Think about a world like that. That is what we're working towards, and that's what you have the opportunity to help with, is us achieving that goal, so that 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, there will be no more free drugs ataxia. It will be a footnote in the medical literature. It will be like smallpox. Boy, that was a terrible disease. I'm glad I've never seen a case of that. So, so you're, you're doing great good and you have a tremendous opportunity. We all work in many disease states and some were closer to effective treatments than others. Some were making great progress, some not. But in this particular moment for free drugs, I think we are entering a historic era, a real pivotal turning point. So I thank you all for your support. Thank the patients, their families. Thank you for your courage and your inspiration. You inspire us. I think the donors who are here, who, who make all this possible with the resources that you provide, the families, the support that you provide, all of those who are working in research and patient care for free drugs every single day, we thank you all. And, and with your help, we will end this disease one day. And I think that day is not terribly far off. But we still need your support and your ongoing commitment. Um, and, uh, and, and I thank all of you, and we appreciate you being here tonight. We look forward to seeing you at the gala. Some of you be at the Biomarker Symposium tomorrow as well. So thank you again, and have a very good evening.